If you have your Bibles, let's be turning to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and we're going to get over there in just a moment. But by way of reference, I want to start off with a few thoughts from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Obviously, as we've mentioned in our class on Sunday morning, the Gospel of John was written to produce belief. It is the Gospel of belief. And as we're dealing with the miracles of Christ on Sunday morning and understanding from John chapter 20 that those miracles recorded so that we may believe, and there are seven in particular recorded for us in the Gospel account of John, we also... Back all the way up to John chapter 1, and when we read verses 1 through 14, we see the apostle giving us the evidence of the nature of Jesus, that he was and is God, God in the flesh, God the the Son, but also God the eternal Word. And certainly that is emphatically affirmed in verses 1 through 3. You skip on down to verse number 14. Having identified the nature of the Word, we are told that the Word became flesh, was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And the phrase here, made flesh, is interesting. When you go back and study it, it literally means in the Word, literally tabernacled among men. You know, and that's a point that Paul stresses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 how our, about our earthly bodies being nothing more than a tabernacle or a tent. And we, when you study the Old Testament tabernacle, you found that, find that it was a portable, that it wasn't permanent but rather temporary. And so these bodies that, that we have, these physical bodies, are temporary. But we understand that our spirit that God endowed us with, will live on in eternity. And so the Word became flesh, and John says we beheld His glory. And we talked about that in our class Sunday morning. But but why was the Word made flesh? What was the purpose of, of the eternal Word coming down to earth and being made flesh? Being made human. What's that? Being made human like we are. Being made human like we are. But why? That's the question that we want to consider. Why did he come down to earth? Why did he take upon the form of a human? Why did he become human? To save. Exactly right, Miss Ruby. And verse number 12 tells us that as many as received him, to to them gave he power, that is, authority, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And hence, verse number 13 talks about a new birth which is made possible by His being made flesh. And of course, when you think about verse 14, that certainly implies that the Word being made flesh, if He became human, He obviously had to have a human birth. And He had to have a human name. You go back to the Old Testament and you look at the great prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. And we're going to look more at this in a few weeks. But you notice what Isaiah prophesied, that the son that would be conceived and be born, his name would be Emmanuel. Is there anything in a name? We're all shaking our heads. What's so important about a name? It identifies. It identifies? What else? Tells you something about the person. Names have meaning. It identifies it and they have meaning. You know, we have a family name. My personal name is Robert, but my family name is Alexander. Hence, you might say I'm Robert and I belong to the family of Alexander. My wife, Susan, she was born Susan Hall. She's Susan who belongs to the Hall family, but now she's Susan Alexander who, by way of being wed to me, is in the Alexander family. So names, as we just we mentioned, are important. And certainly the name Emmanuel is important because it means God with us. Again, it boggles the mind that, that God visited us in the flesh, does it not? 
that He came down from heaven and took, up, took on flesh. Again, John 1, 14. Hence, we, we come now to Matthew chapter 1. And can you imagine... Ladies, all of you ladies here who have had, who have had children, Can you imagine how Mary must have felt upon hearing the news from the angel about what what was to come? That's mind-boggling. It staggers the mind. But let's note verse number 21. In our discussion tonight, I want us to focus on verse 21 as we build this foundation. If someone would, read Matthew 1, verse number 21. Here we have the name that was to be given to this promised son, to this virgin-born son. Is there anything in this name? There's everything in the name of Jesus. What does Jesus mean? According to the text. What does Matthew 1 verse verse number 21 tell us about the name Jesus? Exactly right. He's the Savior. And so, Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. Peter told, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, when you study the the surrounding context, we understand Peter's talking about Jesus. But now the question is, why Jesus? Why Jesus? Now, why, Je- why, well, why Jesus? Why is there salvation only in Jesus? What's that, Brother Larry? God's plan. God's plan. That's exactly right. The plan of God. Again, because of what His name means. There is something in the name, and in this case, there is everything in the name of Jesus. And so for the next few moments in class tonight, let us discuss the true significance and examine the importance of the personal name given to our Lord and Savior, the Christ of Jesus. We're going to look at the, the, the more in-depthly the meaning of the name, the significance of His activity as to why He was made flesh. Obviously, the what His name implies as it relates to our salvation. And and above all, and I think this is a point we often overlook in discussing Christ Jesus, I want us to look at the dignity of the name of Jesus. How should we hold that name? And again, I think we're going to see in the course of this lesson just how important, just how valuable the name of Jesus is and its significance in regards to how we are saved, how all men can enjoy the blessing of salvation, and the need for us to reverence and respect that high and holy name. As we delve further into our study tonight, I find it fascinating as I studied for this lesson that, that the, the name Jesus literally is Hebrew in origin. The Hebrew word for Jesus is Yeshua or Jehoshua, from whence the name Joshua is translated. That's an interesting fact, is it not? Joshua, when you study that, and here's another fascinating point. Joshua in the Hebrew language is parallel to Jesus in the language that was written, that the New Testament was originally written in. The name means Jehovah is is salvation or Savior, as was pointed out. In other words, 
Salvation originates from and comes from God, and it is a blessing only God can give. That is, He's the Savior. Now the question is, which Jesus? When you study the New Testament, do you find more than one Jesus in the New Testament? Let me give you an example. Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 11. In Colossians 4, verse number 11, Paul, in writing to the church at Colossae, says, writes, and and notice this, and Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers. Now notice that, Jesus, which is called Justice. Is this the Jesus we're talking about? No. Now, hold your... Now... Having seen that, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 8. And if someone would, read that passage for us. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 8. Thank you, Brother Keith. Who is the Hebrews writer talking of here? Because when you think about it, Christ in his invitation said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Remember, Jesus, when you trace it back to its Old Testament, the name back to the Old Testament, Joshua. So here we have a reference to, to Joshua, the great servant leader of the Old Testament. So it, it's not that. So it's not this Jesus. Though, though Joshua does serve as a shadow, a forerunner of Jesus. However, we are dealing with Jesus the Christ. In Luke chapter 2, let's go over here now. Luke chapter 2, verse, verse number 11. And let's look at the angel's words, what the angel had to say to Mary here. Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. If someone would, let's read this passage for us. Christ the Lord. Again, when this is Luke's account of his birth, and we understand what Matthew recorded that she should, would call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so here we have the reference to him being the Savior and Christ the Lord. When you think about the name Jesus, we understand that's a significant name. Now pair that up with Christ. What do we have? Jesus Christ. The anointed one of God. What a name, isn't it? But we also see not just any Jesus here, but the one who is our Savior. God with us. But above all, He is the one who is the fulfillment of prophecy. And that's why I love studying the Old Testament. And that's why I try to encourage everyone I talk to, my you know, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, when you study the Old Testament, you know, one of the great great faith-building studies in that is studying the prophecies regarding Jesus. And it builds your faith in God, and it builds your faith in the Word of God. You think about the prophecies regarding, regarding Christ's birth, regarding the church, but above all, you think about Isaiah 53 prophecies regarding his death and we'll study more on that in in Wednesday night in this class later on but you see when we study the life of Jesus the Christ we see how he fulfills these these predictions these prophecies completely when we think about the name of Jesus it's used over 700 times 
in the New Testament. That's a lot, isn't it? If this name is not important, then why does the, why does the New Testament use, employ it so many times? Have you ever heard people say, well, I don't need Jesus? Have you ever had people tell you that as a Christian? That you, when you're trying to teach them or you're trying to reach out to them, have you ever told people, just leave me alone with that Jesus nonsense? That's a tragedy, isn't it? Everybody needs Jesus. As I'm studying for our lesson on st Sunday morning, as I think about the miracles at Capernaum, you know, I, I studied that. I've been studying that account in Mark chapter one, and I've come to the conclusion as I'm putting the lessons, the applications together for us to discuss that it is the utmost height of foolishness for anyone to convince themselves they don't need Jesus. Isn't it? Because if someone says they don't need Jesus, then what are they saying? What, is some, what, it, what are people really saying when they say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus, I don't need him? That's exactly right. They don't care if they are lost. They don't care about salvation. But God cares, doesn't he? When I think about the love that God has for us, and I think in, 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 event, in teaching people, we, we tr strive to emphasize this. And, and I've ran into a bunch of people, and I've conversed with people in times past who don't believe the Bible because they say, how could such a good and loving God send anyone to hell? But yet, I point them to the, the passage at 2 Peter 3, verse 9. God's not willing that any should perish. Does God want anyone to die lost? In reality, is God sending anyone down there? No. Who's sending? Exactly right, Keith. It's man. I, you go back forty, back into fifties and sixties. I've heard. I've had older preachers tell me they've, that they've preached sermons themselves and they've heard sermons themselves entitled God's Roadblocks on the Highway to Hell. Dealing with all those things that God has provided to deter men from traveling that pathway. First and foremost is Jesus the Christ. This name is so important because of what it means for our eternal soul, our eternal destiny. Understanding this, why did Jesus come? To seek and to save the lost. Luke 19, verse number 10. And, and, and that's the mission of the church today, isn't it? That's our mission. The same mission that Christ had. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's our goal. And we do that by, by preaching the gospel, do we not? Romans 1.16 The gospel of Christ is what? God's what unto what? Power unto salvation. We're not ashamed of it, are we? That's why we boldly proclaim it. Probably... When we think about the preaching of the gospel, and indeed Jesus came to preach as well when you study Mark 1, verse 38. When we, you know, you, you think about when we teach others and when they reject the gospel, we, we feel pretty discouraged, don't we? Have you ever felt discouraged in, in teaching someone and you felt like they're this close to obeying and ultimately they decide not to? I had another gentleman tell me one time and it's at the end of a study, well, I know what I need to do, but I just don't want to do it. That's disheartening. Now think about it this way. Can you imagine just how many times Jesus was rejected? 
We talk about how we feel when we're rejected, but Jesus was rejected by many more than we are at times. You think about one instance in particular, Matthew 19, the rich young ruler. What did he do? He wanted eternal life. He asked a great question, but what ultimately did he do? Went away sorrowful. Turned his back on Christ, walked away. He didn't want to do what Christ asked him. Even though Christ wanted to save him, and in fact, the gospel accounts tell, tells us that Christ loved that young ruler. And he loves all mankind. John 3, 16, Romans 5, verse, verse number 8. Jesus came to save, he came to preach. And there's many things he came to do, but ultimately, he came to die. In Matthew chapter 20, verse number 28, let's turn over there, and if someone would read that, I, I want to make mention of this verse before we before we get too far into it. But I like, I love what Christ said here. Matthew 20, verse number 28. You got it, Keith? He has a son of man came not to minister to, but to minister to give his life and that's something for him. Several things we learn about why Christ came here. He came to serve. But he also came to give his life. And I think we sang that song this past Sunday, I gave my life for thee. That truly staggers our minds, doesn't it? That Christ was willing to die in our stead for our sins. As Christians, I guess that should never, that should never be far from our minds, should it? What Christ did for us. Jesus was sent into the world. He became flesh in order to become the Savior of the world. John 3, 17. It is that the world through Him might be saved. I love Romans 5 and verse number 8 where it says that God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet what? Sinners. Sinners. Christ did what? He died for us. Sinners to make our salvation possible through His precious blood. And so as we think about Christ's activity, why He came to this earth, you think about now the fact in Acts 4 verse 12 that salvation is available. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, first of all, God's desire is for who to be saved? All. That's a three-letter word, but that's a powerful word, isn't it? All to be saved. Second Peter 3, verse 9. God is not willing that who should perish? Any. Again, that three-letter word, but that is powerful, isn't it? But that all, but that, I slipped up. Who should come to repentance? All should come to repentance. So again, the, the Bible teaches us that 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 salvation is available for all. The provisions that God provided for, man, for mankind are available to all. However, the New Testament clearly teaches, though, that salvation is only through and in whom? Christ Jesus. Let's turn over now to the book of Ephesians. And I want us to trace a few things here. To notice this principle of salvation in Christ Jesus. And, and we're, gonna, we're just going to go down through here. And we're not going to spend too much time on each of these verses. But I do want us to know a few, a few important points here. Notice verse number 3. And as we go down through here, notice there's going to be one word I want us to pay particular attention to. Ephesians 1 verse 3. We're told that all spiritual blessings were, are, were in Christ. Now notice verse number 7. We have redemption where? 
through his blood, but notice the first two words of the verse. In whom? In whom? Again, there's that two-letter word, in. Now notice verse number 10. Gathered together in one all things where? In Christ. And that's number 3. Notice verse, verse number 11. Where have we obtained an inheritance? In whom? In Him, Christ Jesus. That's number 4. Verses 12 and 13. We first trusted what? In Christ. You see the point we're making? And then you could go on down through here. Verses 18 through 20, we, we read about the riches of glory which are wrought in Christ. And then you go on into chapter 2, verse number 6, we see that we're made to sit together in Christ. I encourage everyone, in your spare time, just sit down and do a study of this word, of, of, the two, of this word in and how it's connected to Christ in the Ephesian letter. And that's an... It's, it gives us a great appreciation for who we are as Christians, does it not? In Christ we enjoy all these things. We are made nigh, in Christ Jesus, we are made nigh unto God by the blood of Christ. It is in Christ we have boldness. And again, this is why, this is why we teach, is it not? Those outside of Christ, what condition are they in? They are lost. And that's an awfully long word in reality, lost. Especially when you think about eternity as we've discussed. And that's why we, we, we spend time is teaching how one gets into Christ. It's not through repentance or confession, but baptism. Galatians 3.27. Romans 6.3 and 4, exactly right. In... Uh, Paul in writing to the Corinthians says, For by one Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized, where? Into one body. So to be in Christ is to be in His church, which is the one body. Another interesting study I would encourage each of you to do, and I may preach these on a, on a Sunday in a few weeks, or a couple weeks, is... Parallel the Ephesian letter, study the Ephesian letter and the Colossian letter together. They're parallel in many ways. Paul in the book of Ephesians exalts the church of the Christ. But the Colossian letter, Paul exalts the Christ of the church. Interesting study. Because when we get into Christ, we are in His church. And so... And, and what is going to happen to the church when Christ comes again? What's that, Ricky? Gather it. Deliver it up. <laughs> Many people today teach the church isn't important, don't they? The Bible teaches it's very important. And again, we're going to talk more about the church in another lesson. But how valuable is the church to Christ? Exactly right, Keith. Loved it enough to die for it. Acts 20, verse 28. 5, 5, 23 and following. He is the Savior of the body. Husbands, we are to love our wives even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. You know, that, that's how far we need to love our wives, husbands. We need to be willing to give our lives for our, for our wives just as Christ gave His for His church. And so we see, we see the blessings that, we can, that all can enjoy in Christ Jesus just from this study. Now having said all of that, understanding the importance of the name, understanding the ramifications, there's a certain dignity to the name of Jesus, isn't there? Herbert Lockyer in his, in his work, All the Divine Names and Titles in the Bible, on page 174, makes mention of this, that, that many names are dear, but the dearest one which grows more clear, or more dear, excuse me, 
with the passage of time is the simple yet sublime name, Jesus. You think about some of the songs that we sing or that you've heard sing, sung. One is there's just something about that name. Uh, you, you like that song, Ricky? That's a beautiful song, isn't it? I wish I could lead it. You, you, you get a, you, you, I've heard it led at singings, and it's a wonderful song. But then you think about how, the song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Now, we all know that song. But you think about the, the line in this song, There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Again, referring to Jesus. And again, because that his name is so sweet to us as Christians, again, that's our motivation for, te for teaching. Then there's the song, The Great Physician, which has this line, Sweetest sound in seraph song, sweetest note on mortal tongue, sweetest anthem ever sung. Jesus, blessed Jesus. When we sing songs of praise unto God, we are honoring Jesus' name through the avenue of song. Have we ever stopped to truly appreciate that fact as we sing? I think sometimes that, that gets lost in, in the mix. But as we sing these songs, think about it as, as Christians, we are honoring the name of Jesus. We're singing to God, exactly. Giving Him the reverence and respect He deserves. Jesus, next, according to Acts 2, verse 33, He is sitting now at the right hand of God, exalted. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, for His name alone is high. Acts 5, 31 teaches us that He is exalted as Savior. And of course, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 9, teaches us that Jesus, the, the name of Jesus is, a name, is that name which is above all other names. As Christians, do we truly appreciate the name we wear? Take away, when we think about the, term, the name Christian, who comes at the beginning? Christ. And we wear that name because we belong to whom? Christ. Now I, like, now I like the I-A-N because without Christ, I ain't nothing. We ain't nothing without Christ. Again, that's another song we often sing. But with Christ, we have everything. When we speak of the name of Jesus, we do so reverently and respectfully. We do this when we confess Him initially with our lips. When we, when prior to our obeying the gospel, what did we do? We confess Christ, Jesus as Son of God. And of course, we, we do so continually by how we live here on this earth. As we strive to walk in the lot, as He is in, in the lot. Oh, there's so much more that we could say about Jesus the Christ, isn't there? about that name that is above all other names. So we think about the, this fact, Jesus was indeed God in the flesh. He was Emmanuel, God with us. His name Jesus emphasizes the fact that He came to seek and to save the lost because the name Jesus means Savior. Jesus is His human name, Christ obviously His official title as the anointed of God. And of course, Emmanuel... That name prophesied by Isaiah reveals to us his nature, that he was of God and that he was and is God, the eternal word. And certainly Jesus as Savior implies this fact, the name implies this fact, and his earthly mission affirmed the fact. The fact he came to this earth to serve and to suffer and die on a cruel cross affirms the things that we have talked about in this lesson tonight. May we always appreciate the significance of the name of Jesus 
and strive diligently to point others to Jesus, who is not just Lord, but as his name entails, he is Savior, and he desires to save all from their sins. The task we have, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is great, but understanding who we are, who Jesus is, we have all the motivation in the world to boldly go forth proclaiming the good news of salvation. Thank you so much this evening for your comments and participation. And next week, we have an interesting study.